At this time, we ask that our hearts and minds would uh, prepare themselves as our services begin. Suddenly, we say to uh, this family and to all of you uh, who have uh, gathered here today, know that God is able. Know that he will comfort you and he will continue to uh, give you strength. The statement has been said time and time again, but my friends, it is certainly true uh, that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Amen. Amen. This time we will have a scripture reading by Sharon Green, followed by a prayer by Pastor Gary Hunter. Amen. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me in the path, I'm sorry, he leadeth me in the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord God, we ask that you not only bless us at this moment, but that you would heal our minds and spirits. We ask that you would touch every crying eye. Give us moments of joy, memories of peace, the anointing of your spirit. Give us the authority of your victory. And then now, Lord, touch our heart, our spirit, and our memories. Give us founded, joyful memories. Please, Lord, give us the understanding to your peace. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And give us that comfort. Give us that peace. We ask for your anointed hand to not only touch us and guide us, but allow your angels to be dispatched. Comfort this family. Comfort this mother. Comfort this father. The extended family and all those that had an extended love. We praise you and thank you for every good and perfect gift that you've given unto us. For every day that you've given us, thank you. For every waking and eye, thank you. For every trial and tribulation, thank you. For every moment of sadness, joy, or either unexpected circumstances, thank you. We thank you because you are our God. And we praise you in the name of Jesus for every living moment. Now give us strength in this day. Give us strength in this time. We praise you and thank you. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever amen now we'll have a song by miss teresa clanton can we ask everyone now to put your phones on mute or either turn them off can we ask everyone right now just just take a moment to do your code and get in there and take the volume all the way down so just in case jesus or the angels call you in the middle of this you know, they know how to leave a message. Somebody say, man, you may come. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely 
had to long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion a constant And I know he watches me. So I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free yeah. oh, his eyes his own the sparrow and I know he watches yes I Do me a favor, just nudge your neighbor and tell him it's going to be all right. Now nudge your other neighbor and tell him it is all right. We'll have acknowledgement and condolence as well as the obituary read now by Alana Jackson as she come. Somebody say amen. praying for you today. To the Morgan family, dear Dwight and Kim, just know that God is always present and you are loved by so many and you are so blessed to have had a very wonderful son such as Marcus. Remember those good times that you shared with Marcus. He was grand with much love, Betty Henderson. Marcus and family, you have touched the hearts of so many people, including me. The room was always filled with smiles when you were around. It was really nice to have you to talk to about our kids. We became parents at the same time. That changed our lives forever. Your memories will be passed along to your daughter, and I'm sure she will be proud you were her dad. All of my love, Julie. The heart is never ready. The time is never right to say goodbye. Thinking of you with deepest sympathy and hoping each new tomorrow will bring you comfort and peace. Marcus will be missed as he was loved by many. God has him and will take care of him. May God bless you with all the comfort and peace. Peggy. Bless you. Thinking of you, Dwight, we are so sorry for your loss. Sending you lots of love and good vibes for you and your family. Alice, Curtis, Austin, Kastuba, Darren, Brick, and Mortar Ventures. In sympathy, thinking of you and wishing you the peace that comes from knowing the memory of the loved one will shine forever. Aunt Jeanette and family. Now for the reading of the obituary.
Marcus Morgan, A Celebration of Life. The sun rose on Marcus April 10th, 1982, and set March 22nd, 2022, at the age of 39 years. He was born in Ithaca, New York, to Ma Rita and Dwight Morgan. The Morgans moved to Michigan shortly after his birth. He grew up in Waterford, Michigan area where he graduated from Waterford Mott High School. He was attractive, ambitious, strong, passionate, adventurous, competitive, and at times impulsive. He was hardworking while at the same time, he had a passion for travel and a zest for family, and a zest for enjoying life that he led. He avoided, he avoided monotony by always wanting to try something new, whether it was eating at a new restaurant or visiting a new city. He liked to make his own life decisions. Marcus shared a strong commitment to family. His sense of loyalty was outstanding. He was always there for everyone who asked for his help, whether it be to reach out to see how you're handling a hardship or to congratulate you on a big or small achievement because he always wanted to see people doing their best in life. He was very sensitive and loved deeply. Marcus has a love and passion for music and performing as a hip hop, a hip -hop artist, which led him to achieve the breaking of a record in the Genesis Book of World Records in the years 2012, lasting 13 hours and 30 minutes, breaking another record in 2014, 17 hours and seven minutes, for the longest freestyle rap. He worked in the food service industry for many years where he honed his communication skills. Later, he formed a partnership providing life coaching, working with people throughout the world, those having difficulty in life and dating relationships. Marcus had a hobby of making unique video clips that were hilarious and showed his sense of humor that were very entertaining. He sought perfection and put 100% into his work. Marcus studied finances and self-taught himself how to resolve debts for others with great success. He was a very sensitive man who demonstrated a great love for family and friends first. He routinely offered words of positive encouragement to everyone. He was loved by many and his memory will forever remain in our hearts. Marcus Dwight Morgan is preceded in death by his grandparents, Harry and Alma Pruitt, Lenny and Olga Morgan, he is survived by his mother, Marita and William Colley, and father, Dwight and Kimberly Morgan, brother, Garrett Morgan, sisters, Bianca and Will Espy, and Savannah Morgan, nephews, Makai Prince Jackson, Harlem Thompson and Blake Epps Espy, nieces, Bailey and Brenton Espy, and Zuri Golston, as well as a host of loving uncles, aunts, and cousins. Friends and family know that Marcus's greatest desire was to be the greatest dad ever. He leaves behind a young daughter. Hashtag, I just want to be the best dad ever. When I am gone, release me. Let me go. I have so many things to see and do. You must not tie yourself to me with tears. But be thankful we had so many good years, although they may have been few. I gave you my love, and you can only guess how much you've given me in happiness. Love, Marcus. When tomorrow starts. When tomorrow starts without me, and I am not there to see, if the sun should rise and I find your eyes filled with tears for me. I wish so much you wouldn't cry the way you did today, while thinking of the many things we didn't get to say. I know how much you love me, as much as I love you. And each time that you think of me, I know that we will miss me too. Um, one more thing that they wanted me to read as well. To the family and friends of Marcus, how blessed we all are to have known him. Marcus was a lovely young man, kind and respectful. We share Makai Prince Jackson, his nephew, my grandson. Marcus was a caring and proud uncle. During my countless stays at the family home, the three of us bonded. 
Marcus would have Prince help him with the chores around the house, always giving him a dollar or two. Then some basketball out front, fun times. The last time I saw him, he looked happy and healthy with that charming boyish smile. I never dreamed sadly it would be no more. I will keep your family and beloved daughter in my prayers. Much love, Rhonda Campbell McKay, AKA Grandma Rhonda. Hashtag gone too soon, hashtag one love. Thank you. I say, man, I'm gonna ask at this time if a few people, two or three, would come and give remarks if you like two minutes. Maybe somebody from the family, somebody from work, somebody. There we go. There go my two. All right, well, you come on first, lady. Okay. Whoever would like to come. Ladies first. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming here. Uh, it means a lot to all of us. Uh, my name is Arianne Anderson. I'm Marcus's cousin. Um, as we all know, uh, Marcus was a, was a uh, rap aficionado. Uh, that was one of his great passions. Uh, so bear with me. I wrote something for him. We came from different mothers, but we were raised as a tribe. Things haven't felt, haven't felt right since Auntie told me you were on the other side. Two weeks ago, you were on my line. A brightness in your tone sounded just fine. It was good to hear your voice. It's been a while since we caught a vibe. So many memories came up when I think of your name. To know you're not here feels so very strange. I never knew I had a brother until you were gone. I remember catching flyer flies with you on the front of Granny's lawn. I remember sharing seatbelts inside of one of Uncle David's old school rides. You and Garrett sneaking out with Auntie, car, Auntie Sharon's car to go for the late night drives. All the hours we spent playing games in Granny's basements, pretending we were taking shots at Grandpa's bar getting wasted, when really, all we had was juice and imagination, but you couldn't tell us we weren't grown-ups at a wine tasting. All the summers we spent together were always hot, faces crammed up in the fridge, looking for a cool pop, splitting time from shooting hoops, going to church or school, coming home to hang with the family, or going to Granny's properties to work, and still being cool. You were always a good buddy to have when Auntie Ingrid would make us take naps, listening to scary jungle music. Who could sleep to that? <laughs> always one with a quick quip, a joke and a laugh, so you to make those nap times just fly on past. Dear Lord, the 90s were really brave. We took turns having hilarious fades. Our fashion sense was still finding its way, but you couldn't tell us that we didn't stay fly every day. Remember when Wu-Tang released 36 Chambers? That was ill. We'd spend hours listening, combing over every detail. Because of you and Garrett, we all grew a love of rap. Cousins, in my mind, you'll always be dope for that. It was great watching you grow into a dad. Well, Silas brought you the most joy that you ever had. Just know that we'll keep your memory alive and we'll smile through the tears because the love you gave us all will last throughout the years. Thank you. Try to keep it together. Uh, I'm Adrian Thompson. I've known Marcus forever. Me and Garrett and Steve and Marcus is like a brother to me. I know I'm Rita. I said well, this is kindergarten. I knew Marcus wasn't even in kindergarten when I met Marcus. Um, I just seen him last Sunday. You know, was, and I still remember his laugh before he left. You know, the ho, 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 you know, and uh, <laughs> and um. And as I'm sitting up here, I have so many memories of Marcus. I mean, like I said, lifelong friend. I mean, I remember bringing Makai over when we were seeing the Pontiac as a kid. And him running upstairs and Marcus saying, is he bothering you? I was like, oh, he's good. Um, but I'm going uh, <laughs> to share a quick story so not everybody's going to want to talk. The one that I just, because I remember Marcus, as, if you knew Marcus as a kid, he was, he was little, he was something special. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, my Aunt Kendall tied him up to a chair. It was, Marcus was a different kind of kid. 
Um, I'm going to tell you the story about me, Garrett, and uh, Steve. Couldn't have been more. I don't know. Maybe we were in, me and Garrett and Steve were in sixth grade. Maybe we were in fifth grade. I don't know. Marcus was Marcus because he's like a little brother. So he was, you know, third, fourth, whatever. So, uh, you know, Marcus got, I think was getting on Steve's nerves. And Steve got him in the headlock, right? Got him in the headlock. And, you know, as kids, you want to you spend the night no matter what. Because at the end of the night, you're like, hey, we all need to spend the night. You know, Marcus, me and Marcus, he's like, I'm telling mom. I'm telling I'm tell mom. And we're like, we're like, no, no, don't, don't tell mom. Don't tell mom. And, he's, and then Gary came up with the idea, I'll give you a free shot of Steve. <laughs> I'm going to give you a free shot of Steve, you know. We're like, all right, we'll give Steve a free shot. You know, Steve's like, because Steve knows Marcus. No, 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 no. <laughs> so either way, because we all want to stay tonight. So we get Marcus. Garrett, Garrett gets Steve like this, right? I think he's going to hit him hard as he can in the chest. I mean, that's this time Marcus ain't nothing but 65 pounds, maybe, at best. Of all his might, hit him right in the face. <laughs> right, right in the face, not in the chest, right in the face, as hard as he could. <laughs> this is what they said in Mudderbrook. <laughs> Steve chased, <laughs> Steve chased Marcus around the whole neighborhood for like 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. Marcus was fast back then. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, everything was good. We all did stay the night. But uh, it's, it's going to be hard not seeing, being able to call Marcus. Even Marcus called me just for advice or whatever. Because like I said, I, I don't remember not knowing Marcus. And uh, he's loved by everybody. You know, look at, look at the ground. Look at everybody here. I mean, this is how many people he touched. Just, you know, me and him. And although he, it was a short life, you know, we, we always want more. We lived a full life. Marcus was a rapper. You got to travel all the time. Marcus did a lot of things that people want, may not do. We lived to 80. He might do, not accomplish as much as Marcus did. You know, he's getting his book world records. There's so many accomplishments he did in the short time that he's been here and the lives he touched. All right. Kim wants to make sure that y'all know. Come on around. Those of you that are family and friends, feel free to come and uh, line up right here, please. How's everybody doing today? I'm uh, Garrett, uh, Marcus's brother. Um, if there's uh, any person that spent the most time with that man on planet Earth, it was me. Um, I have so many stories to tell uh guinness book of world records i can go on a guinness book of talking about marcus to be honest with you um from the very first day i remember laying eyes on him i was just talking about this with my mother um the day he was born um i actually visually remember that moment and how excited i was to say i have a little brother i'm able to describe the detail in the room um it's kind of crazy um, but i actually truly remember and uh, from that day forth, I had a best friend at all times. Um, did we get along at all times? No, we did not, you know? And it was in my duty to make sure that he turned into the stoic man that he turned into. You know, I challenged him all the time. And uh, I loved doing it, and I and know he endured, endured it, and he enjoyed it as well. Because, um, you know, he would, he would thank me many, many times over the years for uh, having the relationship that we did. Um, I remember, um, uh, you know, Adrian had a little story, and I just remember my brother being uh, such a shadow of mine. You know, of course, having a little brother, you know, there's times that you're upset and you're like, what are you doing? And there's other times you're like, hey, little brother, play ball with me, you know. And if I, uh, if I could have that all over again, I swear I would give every dollar I have to be able to have just that one last moment with him. Uh, some, of the, some of my most favorite moments, um, as I could like to announce, uh, my uh, good friend Nasheed Sullivan just entered the room. Um, he was, um, you know, an epic part of our lives, uh, inspiring us. Scab D over on the side, um, my man Mario in the back. Uh, some of my fondest memories with my brother were the times that uh, we actually were grown men and we actually started to make music together. Uh, there was a deeper connection that we had uh, performing as artists in front of people. Um, if there's anything that I can say I, I enjoyed more than anything um, was knowing that he was shining on that stage. As, as hip-hop enthusiasts, as my cousin had said, you know, it was an infectious uh, vibe for us in the 90s that we engulfed every single last little moment of television that we could from Rap City to freestyle battles. I remember my brother sneaking in on me as I was making my first freestyle battle to a, a dog pound song, and I looked over around the corner, and he had this big old smile on his face like, ooh. <laughs> 
And uh, as soon as I saw him, that connection happened. You know, we were uh, we were hip hop monsters after that. And uh, being able to have that stage with him, um, I'd like to say I was the better rapper, but. Uh, <laughs> But the exciting part about being on stage with him is that it, it was my moment to let my little brother shine as hard as he could. And I always wanted to make sure every performance was as flawless as it could be to make sure that he had those moments. Um, you know, uh, I remember a time with my brother, and let me take it back as a moment, uh, just being a shadow of me. I remember a time, and I've told this story to a couple of different people. He, he, he was totally off the wall, crazy kid, full of energy, I like to call him a sanguine personality type. But there was this time he said to me, he said, hey, Garrett, um, you want to put me in this trunk and roll me down the steps? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> Get in. Okay. He opens up the top. Hey, that was fun. Let's do it again. I said, oh, no, we're done doing that. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble, and, uh, yeah, we won't be able to play, and you'll end up having to punch Steve in the stomach, and, you know. <laughs> But uh, but but bringing it back to uh, you know the uh, the storyline of Marcus and Garrett, you know we were uh, Bert and Ernie, uh, as my mom would say, um, you know part of a crew of uh, heathens of kids that wrapped around our home in and out all the time, tons of gags and broken drywall. I know there's people that understand that story out there, you know, and um, you know I I I, I just can't say enough about that man. Uh, he was a dear spirit to me, a piece of my soul, more than I could even express. Um, from, the, again, the moment that I laid eyes on him to looking at him today, he will always internally be in my spirit. And, um, you know, I just want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, you know, I've, I've dropped a thousand tears and it's taken a, a million moments of breathing for me to control myself to even be up here in front of everybody but i am here to celebrate my brother's life in every dimension and uh you know i want to i want to hear every story i want to hear every emotion every 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 moment you had with marcus if you only understand is one, one of the most important things i could hold dear to my heart i love you all thank you for being here today Peace, y'all. Um, I'm not going to be long. Uh, my name is uh, Nashi. Uh, and uh, I didn't grow up with Marcus, but uh, like uh, Garrett was saying, um, I've been seeing these dudes for the last 20 years just coming to hip-hop shows. I've probably seen them a thousand times, you know what I mean? And uh, I just saw Garrett maybe like a week ago, two weeks ago. We had a show in Detroit. And, you know, we chopped it up like normal, you know what I'm saying? So when I saw him post it on Facebook, I was like, whoa, what's that? Um, but I just wanted to say that, you know, for the last 20 years, man, these brothers been supportive, you know what I mean? Like, we wasn't like blood or nothing like that, but we was brothers like in the hip hop community, you know what I'm saying? And uh, a lot of people look up to like famous people, you know, Jay-Z and, you know, whoever, um, but um, a lot of times the people that inspire you the most it'd be just, you know, excuse my language, regular people, you know what I mean? And like, you know, might be a couple years older than y'all, but I know y'all was like taking notes, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, people want to take your spot, so y'all was keeping me on my toes, because I'm like, oh, they, they, I know, I know, I'm like, I know what it is, but I just wanted to thank you, man, you and your brother, man. And shout out to Stilo because I didn't know how I was going to get, I, I wanted, I, I live in Cairo, so when I found out about this, I was like, man, I don't even know how I'm going to get there, man. But I had to come out here. So, um, you know, um, no, nah, man, y'all are superheroes, bro. So I just want to say that and uh, much love to everybody here, man. Stay up. Yeah. morning. Most of you have no idea who I am, and I'm so sorry we had to meet under these circumstances. Um, me and Marcus talked a lot about meeting his friends and family, but for the last five months, I got to know and be a part of Marcus's life. Um, we were dating for the last five months. 
So I wrote something and I wanted to honor him in the best way I could. Um, so at first, me and Marcus wanted to keep everything to ourselves. We didn't want any feedback or interference, good, good or bad. We didn't quite know where it was going. But as the days and the weeks passed on, he continued to prove himself as a trustworthy, genuine man. It's what I loved most about him. He was nothing but a true gentleman. His consistency, respect, and pursuit for me built as the weeks went on. I never had to question where he was with me or where he stood with me. And the walls I discreetly held up were crashing down. Our connection was growing stronger and we were opening up more and more to each other, starting to tell our friends and family more and more. And it was beginning to blossom into a beautiful love story. I'm so heartbreaking to, see, to say the least. I've gone through a lot of loss over the last couple of years and this is the biggest heartbreak I've ever experienced. He was a breath of fresh air in my life after those several really rough years. He brought me so much happiness and joy that had been buried away. He was a light at the end of the dark, a dark tunnel for me. He taught me how a good woman deserved to be treated with respect, lightness, ease, patience, and kindness, thoughtfulness, and encouragement. He was a man of his word, a provider, and a protector. He was the type of guy that plowed the driveway, but not before he plowed his neighbors first. He was teaching me how to receive without feeling like I had to give something back. He helped me to rediscover that worth comes from who you are and not what you do. He was the biggest supporter I've ever had in my business. In the 18 weeks that we dated, he missed not one day commenting on my Instagram to encourage me. He helped me get the courage for a gym membership. He showered me with generosity and compliments, gifts, flights, and dates just because I slightly mentioned something that I wanted. He helped me cross off a few items on my bucket list and had plans to cross off more. He taught me how to rap. <laughs> I know I don't look like a rapper. <laughs> and we ha it was a really, it's a really good memory. He helped me rebuild my confidence. He would call me just because and to check in on me. He was always happy and excited to see me, which made me feel so happy. I enjoyed every second I ever spent with him, and I always looked forward to seeing him. Like it was said in his, in his obituary, he did free me of debt, and he made me laugh more than anyone else. I can only ha hope I was half the contribution to him that he was to my life. Over a year ago, I wrote a list of all the things I wanted in my next relationship. And a few weeks ago, when I went through that list, he marked every single box. I, I, it's long, so I'm not gonna keep going, but I just, I've never met such a precious soul. And um, I just wanna thank you all for sharing him with me. Um, thank you. Is there anyone else? As we prepare for the song, one more. It's really hard to breathe. Um, <clears throat> my name is Rebecca. I worked with Marcus. Um, I worked with Marcus actually for six years, so he was hired like the same month that I was. Um, and I have learned more about Mark. I worked with Marcus for six years, but I've learned more about Marcus after his passing than I knew about him knowing him and seeing him every day. For, for weeks at a time, you see a consistent person in your life. Um, he was just awesome working with him. You guys know, a bunch of you know him so much more intimately and so much more differently than we did. Marcus was very protected. He was very, um, he kept people at a distance that worked with him, and I know why, because he was so special and so sweet and so amazing. It's like, 
How do you just share that with everyone? You can't have everyone falling over Marcus. <laughs> so Marcus was the tall, handsome dude. I'm 5'2". He's like, what, 6'3", 6'2"? Um, and we found out that he had a nickname for everyone. Mine was Little Buddy. Um, <laughs> but I have a small story. A couple months working with him, or maybe a year working with him, he would joke about how he had hair and he's a rapper and he's thug life. <laughs> and I literally look up at this man and I said, sir, you are not thug life. <laughs> and he goes, what? And I said, you were raised right. And he goes, how do you know? I know. I know by the way you walk. I know by the way you treat people. I know by the way you let me go through the door first when I have plates in my hand or the way that you help me or now I know the countless ways that he showed his love and affection and was there for people because that was his heart. He was just there for people. Um, it's amazing for all of us that worked with him to have that stor the stories that we have interacting with him as friends and then learning things about him. I have so much admiration for everyone that loved him and had an influence in who he was because he was an amazing man. And I, I, I'm so thankful to get to know the things that I didn't know about him before and just say thank you for raising him right, honestly. Um, and maybe you don't know, but for years, this man has told us he has a twin. So I just want to say for the record, I know he doesn't. So if anyone still believes the, the, the fib, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Mm -hmm. I'm sister. I'm his sister, Bianca. I haven't even sat down and digested this yet. But what I can remember, I didn't even realize how loyal of a friend a lot of you guys had in this room. How good of a brother I had. And how he was a big part of raising his nephew, Makai, that I realized has been around a lot of you guys while I was at work. He spent a lot of time with my son and his nephew. He never, I honestly, you guys all got more time with him as an adult than I did, but it was because he was helping me out as family with my son. We lived together for years, which you guys all know, you know, we worked with each other. He had called me, hey, I get off work at this time when, when you got to go to work. So, you know, I, I, li I literally actively lived with him, but at the same time, you know, you guys got more time with him. But today, if I can add up the years, there's people 38 years in with him, friends, you guys came from across the country, put your guys' life on hold, drop whatever. Plane tickets are the craziest prices we seen ever. You guys got here whether you got on a bus, however, you don't know how appreciated it, how loved it, how helpful for the closure. Then the healing process for my mother, for my father, for the other friends. I would always tease my brother and tell him, Dude, you only want to keep up with the people from elementary, dude. What's wrong with you, man? Like, dude, I'm not thinking about them. Yeah, but guess what? I get it now. I get it. Like I'm saying, oh, you got like something about family hour. You guys are family, dude. You knew him. The joke with the lot of Steve. I knew. I knew your mom before you. I knew your brother before you. Yes, you guys did. There's a lot of people in this room that knew my brother longer than he knew me, longer than he knew his little sister, you know. But now I get it. Also, one other quick joke. Me and my brother would have a debate. A lot of times I would end the debate. I'd say, dude, stop talking to me. You don't know what you're talking about. That's how they always ended. We were talking about loyalty, like with friendship. But I get it because we were just talking about something general. Like, dude, you couldn't trust nobody holding a million dollars for you in cash. He was like, yes, you could. I would. What do you mean? No, you couldn't. You don't have a real friend. I said, dude, 
you would never be able to hold, you know, you don't have friends like that. There ain't, ain't no friends like that. But now that I honestly know, my brother was a loyal friend. <laughs> you might have to buy him a beer or something to eat, but guess what? I know that he would do that for you guys. Like, we, act, we lost a loyal friend, but, but at the same time, it made sense. All these memories that all we have, it made sense why it was shortened. We know it's gonna be shortened, but we all have a lot of memories with that irritating little boy. <laughs> and look, a lot of my friends, they never, they don't understand the childhood stories of Marcus because they know him as that man because they don't line up, you know? But thank you. You don't know. Stay in the room. You, got, you don't get it. You guys don't get how the love here, the, the love that you guys brought today is a part of the healing process for my family and your guys' self. Well, I appreciate it so much. I appreciate it so much. The family does the free. The friends do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before the solars come, we're going to have Miss Kimberly to come in her own way. Let's give everybody a hand for sharing these moments and memories of joy. Y'all can do better than that. Y'all can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. The Thursday that we discovered Marcus was no longer with us. The Thursday we found Marcus sleeping forever was not one of the worst days of my life. It was the worst day of my life. Marcus was so full of life. He was so full of love. He was so full of joy. He didn't let too many things bother him. We talked all the time. Marcus taught me how to multitask because he would call me and sometimes he would just want to talk two hours, three hours. And I started wearing AirPods. I had to buy a pair so that I could go to the dry cleaners and clean the kitchen and do whatever. But I made myself available for him. He's been my bonus son for almost 20 years. And there isn't a day that passed that I haven't loved Marcus as if he were my own son. I have a son, and when I think of him and I think of Marcus, I get the same feeling. In fact, I spent more time with Marcus as an adult than I did my own son. I loved him so much. I'm so overwhelmed. I have something that I just want to go through, but just looking at all of these people, look at all. You know what we feel. You know how we feel. We thank you. We're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you for helping us get through this very, very difficult time. I said to a girlfriend who stayed over with me Friday night, we woke up Saturday and we're just, I was waiting for my husband to come into town. And I had an epiphany and I said, heaven must be an amazing place. It has to be because Marcus left to go there. And if it wasn't, had he not gotten a glimmer of it, he never would have left us. And I know that to be true, and I believe that with all of my heart. So just bear with me for just a couple minutes, please. <coughs> to the family of Marcus, 
Dwight Morgan. I am so sorry for your loss. I know how painful it can be to lose a family member. And Marcus died far too young. These are extraordinarily tough times for so many, which can make a personal loss like yours so much harder to bear. I know the process of healing will be lengthy, but I wanted you personally to know that I am thinking of you and your family and wish you grace and peace during this time of grief. Sincerely, Warren C. Evans, Wayne County Executive, thought enough of us and enough of Marcus to write a personal letter to let you know just how special Marcus is, was, and forever will be. Marcus had integrity. My husband sold Marcus a car, and I was saying, give it to him, just give it to him, let him have it. But he's teaching him how to be a man. And he said, if I give it to him, he won't respect it. So I'm going to charge him a little something for it. So my husband said to Marcus, give him all the payments. So after he made a couple of payments, I said, you don't have to make any more. I said, your dad will never know. I'm not going to tell him. So we're good, OK? Marcus never said anything, but those payments kept coming month after month after month after month. And when he made that last payment, he said, now I'm done. And it made me so proud of that young man. It made me so proud of him. Marcus painted my office at home. And he says, Kim, I've never done this before. And I said, it's OK. Just take your time. My husband went in and gave him some instructions. He showed up every day with pride. The room is three different colors. And it's perfect. He showed up every day with pride. And he got through that process as if he had been doing this his whole life. He took pride in what he did. He, took, he put love in it. I told his mother, I said, I'm stuck with this room. I will never change it because Marcus painted it. I was on my way to the airport back in November. And m my friends, family know that I'm a retired law enforcement officer. So I'm accustomed to carrying a gun. I had my gun in my purse and forgot to take it out. I made one call. I called Marcus. I said, Marcus, what are you doing? And he said, just chilling, you know, laying in bed, I'm not doing anything. And I said, I need you to do me a favor. He said, sure. I said, I need you to meet me at the airport. We were almost at the airport. I was in an Uber. I said, I need you to meet me at the airport so you can get my gun from me. Because I, I ran through, who do I trust enough to handle this responsibility? Who do I trust? And I thought of all of our children. But the one that I knew could get there the fastest would be Marcus. When we pulled up to the airport, Marcus pulled up behind the car. I said, how'd you get here? He started sharing, sharing his location with me. And he pulled up right alongside me. So I unloaded it. I wanted him to see that it was unloaded, you know, proper precautions, all of that. And I separated the bullets from the gun itself, just protocol. I said, Marcus, take this gun home. Don't drive around in the car with it. I don't want to be worried about you. Go straight home. When I returned from our trip, I think he actually met us. He met us in New York that time. So when I got back, I had been back two or three weeks just running around, running errands, and forgot to get the gun. I said, OK, let me go and get the gun. I called him. I'm on my way over to your house. Marcus had the gun on top of his refrigerator. So he reached up, and he got the gun, but he had it in his inside of his t-shirt so that he, his fingerprints wouldn't be on the handle. So he held it inside, he held it inside his t-shirt, and then he used the other end of his t-shirt to wipe his fingerprints off. <laughs> and he handed it to me through his t-shirt. 
And, you know, while I'm looking at him, he says, Kim, I love you and everything, but I don't know, you know. <laughs> I said to him, I said, I need to be concerned about you. You wiping off your fingerprints, okay? <laughs> but we got a really good laugh off of that. Mark has spent a lot of time with us. We've traveled. We would do dinner on the weekends frequently. I would call him baby. I would whisper it and say, Marcus, you know you're my baby, right? And he would say, that's fine with me. It don't bother me none. So that was our, that was our, that was between us. To Dwight and Marita, thank you for sharing your son with me. I love you. I'm his bonus mom. I have your back. 100%. I'm here with Garrett and Bianca. They are not without. I'm here for you. Thank you for sharing your son with me. I love you. Thank you, Dwight. I love you. God bless you all. I'm so overwhelmed. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you so much, Bianca, you know, Makai, just everybody. Will, thank you for pitching and stepping up. Just everybody, just thank you so much to Marcus's stepfather, everybody. I know we start naming names. Garrett, I love you. Thank you. Just thank you. I'm just so overwhelmed. Thank you all so much. God bless you. I love you. I have to say just this one thing so that I'm, I'm done with it. When Marcus would come to our home, he'd always come to the front door. I have to tell the story. And I, everybody else comes through the garage. Marcus come through the front door. So I said, Marcus, go through the garage. Marcus come back the next day, he come to the front door. I said, Marcus, we use the garage. Marcus come back the next day, he come to the front door. So I started saying to Dwight, what's wrong with him? He keep using the front door. So I started opening up the kitchen window, saying, Marcus, go to the garage. Mark has still come back to the front door. Finally, I said, okay, I get it. You're a king. You're a king. I get it. Kings come through the front door. To me, Marcus, he was a saint to me. And now he's an angel for all of us. God bless you all. I love you all so much on behalf of all of us. Thank you so much. God bless you. I love you. Let's give her a hand, y'all. Now I see why I didn't want to use that garage door last night. There's two kings. It's bad enough I had to take my shoes off to cook uh, while I'm cooking lobster and lamb chops and shrimp macaroni and cheese. I got to take my shoes off. I should have just said, no, Marcus said I don't have to. <laughs> uh, but thank you for sharing each one of you. Uh, if you know this family, you know they're loving, they're caring. When they first meet you, whether they, you, you've been around or not, those, when you, you, I just noticed last night here and at the house, you know, all while I'm in the kitchen, people coming in and, you know, uh, just everybody, you, you got to understand this and I'm going to get out the way. When there's true love and what, what she didn't say, home training, the atmosphere is open up to God because God gives respect to order and I want to thank each of you for showing Dwight you know you were Stella he was my uh, shoe chef he kept saying uh, don't do that I'm trying to do everything don't do that I'm the shoe chef I'm the shoe chef but that's the kind of servitude and love they have here I'm trying to comfort him and he's trying to do everything and you know, he went out to the grill to act like he was grilling like me, you know. Uh, you know, he did the uh, grilling while I was doing the cooking. But I just want to say that personality, Garrett, uh, as you expressed, that, that, that camaraderie, you know. And anybody that's got brothers and sisters that never had a fight, I don't know what kind of brother and sister you got. There's something wrong with you when you ain't got a whooping and you never had a fight. You ain't no real person. Somebody, and you sure ain't from the hood or the second hood. You know, there's second hoods now. Uh, but as we prepare for the psalmist and as we prepare uh, uh, after she 
uh, sings, I'll come back and introduce uh, who will be doing the eulogy. Somebody say amen. amen. Do me a favor. Just give everybody in the air. It's COVID. In the air, give everybody a hug. Y'all gave some weak hugs. Come on, let's do it again. A big hug. There you go. I just hope you brush your teeth. Last night, about 1 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't think of a second song. And then I had to think about all the love that uh, my sister shared with her family, her husband, friends. I got to I'm sorry. Um, and the only song that came to mind, I sent it to her. And after hearing all these wonderful stories, it is fitting. I'm going to need you to not play right now. Thank you. Looking over the horizon, night breaks into dawn. I get a little misty-eyed, knowing you've gone on. I've come to realize just how much a presence meant to me. And I also realize that now you're finally free. I'll always love you for the special times we shared, all the times you let me know. Just how much you cared for me, I'll always love you. You were a friend that I can totally depend on. I love you, and you're forever with me. The will of the Father had to be fulfilled. I feel your spirit. Your voice still gives me chills. The anointing is still touching today. I sing this with a smile and tears of joy just to say I'll always love you. For the special times we shared, all oh, the times you let me know, just how much you cared for me, I'll always love you. You are a friend that I could totally depend on. I love you, and you're forever with me. We to sing together, cry together, and laugh together. You know it didn't matter, cause God always take care. You taught me how to live and give, when giving seemed to be too much. The benefits of your love was our reward. For the special times we shared, all the times you let me know just how much you cared. I love you. You are a friend that I could totally depend on. I love you, and you're forever with me. Yes, you're forever with me. Testing, as we prepare for this moment, 
Every eye closed, every head bowed. Repeat after me, Lord, help us to send our energy, our love, our peace, and help us to receive this Father for his message, a builder, a creator, and a man that stood and stands for love. Please receive Mr. Dwight Morgan. Let's give him a hand. I'm going to make this fast because I, I know how difficult it must be to stand as long as this is. Um, my name is Dwight Morgan. I, uh, I am the father of Marcus. And uh, I, the, the number of people that came yesterday and the number of people that are here today to pay their respects to my son is, is really the true testimony as to the difference he made on this earth. Um, he would have been so honored and honestly humbled to see the love that all of you have brought here just for him. It would have reminded me of when Kimberly and I went to see him at work and uh, we specifically asked to sit in his section and we started taking pictures and making him take pictures with us and he started walking around at the restaurant and more and he said, Kim, Kim, this is embarrassing. You can't do this to me. I work here. But he was always a humble, a humble young man. So thank you for being in my son's life. Um, I, I lost my brother. So I, I know what Bianca and Savannah and Garrett are feeling. I lost my brother almost at the same age, 37. Uh, and many of you are probably sitting here going, how could this human specimen of fitness and love go so soon. So sometimes there's lots of people that ask questions. I'll tell you what we, we, we know and what we don't know. What we, what we know that didn't happen is he didn't have a heart attack. He didn't have a stroke. He didn't have a pulmonary embolism. He didn't have an organ that failed. The medical examiner came back and said he died from nothing. I said, excuse me? He said, I don't know how to fill out this, I don't know how to fill out the, birth, the death certificate. He goes, I have to. He said, but there's nothing wrong with your son's body. Nothing. So they kicked it over to toxicological, which will come back in a little while. But the police and everybody at the house said, even the police said, we're done. We're not even going to spend any more time because there's nothing in this man's house that's untoward. His time had come. And I share with you just a quick, quick thing, and that is what I've learned from all of you is Marcus had a bright light. And um, the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. So for the past few days, I kept thinking, you know, what, what are the words that I should say to you? I, should have, I don't need to get up here and tell you stories. You all have your own stories. Um, but what I'm going to do is spend you and tell you a little bit of time telling you what I learned from my son. We all think as parents that we are the teacher. But I can tell you that I have learned a lot from my son. So a eulogy is about telling somebody's life but it's really not necessary because every one of you really do know what he did to you individually. So today I want to explain, explain to you certain things. So before we start on this journey of this, I, I wanted to just ask you a simple thing. When you hear the, the name Marcus, Morgan, what words immediately come to mind? Okay. And I just started jotting down a few of them and you'll all have your own. The first one that came to mind, I heard it from his mother. She sat here and we, we came in to view the body and get prepared for this day. She said, he's so strong. Not my Marcus. He's so strong. This couldn't happen to such a strong body. 
So, strength. We talked about his laugh, the <laughs> laugh, okay? Which I think his brother caught it too, because they both laughed the same damn way. Um, he's humorous. I watched it the whole time growing up. I mean, I would look for him. I was looking in the house one day for him. I go, where is this kid? You know, a little skinny little kid. And then I, all of a sudden, I, uh, I ask Garrett, Bianca, where is he? And no one's saying. You know, they're, not, they're not ratting him out. They're no snitches. So I, I'm starting to panic because I have this history of creating panicking situations with my son, Marcus. I had Marcus before I graduated college. He was my son. He, gradu he was born on the 10th day of April in 1982, and I graduated March 30th out of Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And I was so focused in on panicking about how to be a dad, I didn't even know how to be a man. I was 21 years old. I had two sons. I had Garrett and I had Marcus. I had to figure out how am I going to support them? What am I going to do with my life? And I was just focused in on get a job and buy a house. It wasn't get a job and rent an apartment. It was get a job and build a house, buy a house, do something, and get it done fast because my kids needed to have that type of a life. So it was the last week of college. I had to take final exams. I already had a job. I didn't even know why I even took the damn exam. I, had to I already had the job, but I was so focused on doing well. And uh, Marcus was about uh, probably a week or two old, and I literally forgot that I had a son for a moment. And I was so focused on myself. And I literally, I had nothing, you know. I was a young kid. I didn't have a bassinet. I didn't have anything yet. We were just, you know, two young couples. I put him in a drawer, okay? I didn't close the drawer. <laughs> I didn't close the drawer, okay? I just put him in the drawer. Okay, kind of act like a bassinet. I put him in a drawer. I didn't, and I went to my final exam at some grade. I don't know what it was. And then I came back, you know, 6 o'clock, I'm pumped up. Yeah, I know I did good in this test. Yeah, I'm graduating. I got to go. We're, gonna get, we're going to Michigan. I got a good job. And Marita goes, you idiot. I go, what? She said, you left the your son at home. I literally forgot. Okay, I literally forgot. There was no cell phone. There was no nothing for, the, for me to call and say, hey, I think I forgot our son there. He was so quiet of a baby. I left him at home. Okay? Today, I think they probably put me away in Child Protective Services or something I mean, for that. So I, I, got a, I, got a bad, I get a lot of anxiety when I can't find my children, especially Marcus, because I have a track record of leaving him where he's not supposed to be. Okay? So when nobody wants to find him at home, I go, where is this kid? Where is this kid? His sister, his brother, no one's talking. I decide I'm going up and down the house. I'm starting to panic. The heart's beating. And then all of a sudden, I go into the laundry room and... I hear this knocking, and he's inside the dryer. <laughs> he's inside the dryer. We have a picture of it. I couldn't fi we could not find it for this uh, obituary. So long story short is he's quite humorous, and I'm not going to tell you more stories than that. But as he grew up as a man, he also became an, an encourager. I noticed that, that that was that he would encourage everybody to do their best, and he grew into this idea to become a, a life coach because people felt comfortable with him, and he was a self-taught life coach. Marcus would read, and Marcus was dependable. Whenever we called him, he came. Whenever we had a function at the house, he was there. We never had to say, where is he? Um, he was caring. He was a family first kind of guy, and he was very thankful for everything we ever did for him and for what you have done for him as well. And the key is he's real. He really didn't dress up and want to wear ties and suits and all that. You know, he told me how to wear a scarf. That's how you can tell. That's his look. And um, he's unique. He definitely was a unique young man. And the thing I like about it was he was a storyteller through his music. And he told a story. Um, healthy. And at the end, he said it all with a hashtag, and that is, I just want to be the best dad ever. Okay. So during my last few days, I learned a lot about my son's life, and I realized that it's all truly about love. Um, and, I, and I also learned about how his life was impacted by what I did as a dad and what I didn't do as a dad, and also what people did to stand in my gap. Um, Marcus taught me the, the, the value of extended family. 
And, you know, Marcus, we, we laugh and say he's got two moms, okay? And that's because uh, his, his birth mom and I, you know, we separated at a, at, when the kids were still young. And I got to say, it did a lot of damage. And um, I take full responsibility for that. The key is um, Marcus took it as a different way. As he grew up, he said, and I apologized to him. I said, I know I put you through some real mess with that divorce. I should have maybe thought a different way to do things and maybe just, you know, just didn't do it right. And he told me, he said, Dad, you're good, man. He goes, he said, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I said, how is that? He says, I got two mothers. He says, I got two moms. And I said, that's why I love my son, because that's the way he thought. So I want to thank Kimberly for restoring our family, my wife Kimberly. She showed me that uh, there is no such word as stepmom or stepsile. When I would introduce Marcus to people, I'd say, oh, this is Kimberly, his stepmom, and she would correct me. She'd say, don't you say that. I am not step. He is not a step. He is not different. He is not. He is our family, and he is my son. And I learned a lot about how important one little word of step means and how it changes a, a, a kid's self-esteem and feeling of self-worth and just feeling of how being part of a family. And, and through Kimberly, I appreciate everything you did to restore my family with my kids. And I love you for it. There's nothing more important to Marcus and family. He lived that out in every 39 years of his life. Um, so he was born at 11.45 a.m. just before Easter Sunday. I couldn't remember. I had to ask Marita just a couple days ago, so when was he born? Was it afternoon, morning, noon, lunch, you know? I think my first biological son, I'd know. And she said, 11.45 p.m., he just missed Easter Sunday, the day of resurrection. And then she also said, you don't remember because you were drunk, is what she told me. <laughs> okay? So that's what she did. In biblical terms, you know what, naming your children sometimes, you think it's just an easy thing. My middle name was, is Mark. So I think maybe, and I'm probably, I'm not even going to say this is true. I believe that that's how somehow Marita and I got to name him Marcus. Because I didn't really like the word Mark. I didn't like it. So I think somehow we, she compromised and we agreed to Marcus. And now I'll sit back and i learn a little bit about him. Um, this, this, is, this is a book that I think everybody... I don't know everybody here who's, some people might be spiritual, some might be religious, some might be of different religions, and I don't want to turn this into a church-going service, but I want to make sure that everybody understands the way Marcus lived. He's a very spiritual man, and he is today, and that's why I can't cry up here, and it's not because I don't love him, because I know where he is, all right? This is a book of birthdays. It's an amazing book. It is a book that's thick. It's about $100 out of Amazon, and every single one, one out of 365 days, there is a, a, a two-page story about who every one of us are. And I'd say that this book is in the 90% accurate. And it is done by statisticians, not done by, you know, astrology people or religious people. It was done by statistics. They looked at people, checked all their behaviors, and they put together a statistical report. And I got to say, when I read this about April 10th, that this book is accurate for my son. I'm not going to read it to you, but... I want each and every one of you to consider getting that book, okay? It was one of Marcus's favorites. So Marcus, is a, his name is a biblical name. It's not, he's not named after me. He's named after somebody in the Bible. And Marcus in the Bible means um, polite and shining. So it's interesting when you name your kid at 21, you think you're just calling him, naming him after yourself. You're not even, you're not, even, you're not naming him. The world, the spirit is naming your son. Marcus is polite and shining. I think no one will disagree with that. Okay? He's dedicated to the planet Mars, Marcus and Mars, which is the red planet. Many of you think his favorite color is gray and black, but it's actually red. When he really wanted to do something, it was red. In his obituary, you'll see Marcus D. Morgan, it was red. It was the red planet. He was born in Mars. The thing about Mars and Aries people is they hit the ground running, but most of the time they don't necessarily make it to the finish line, the finish line that we decide. And I can say my son didn't make it to the finish line that we decided for him, but he made it to a finish line for himself. So if you are a Mars sign, 
and you believe in astrology and you believe in spirituality, you'll realize that um, he's also ruled by certain numbers. And this is the part of the story where I'm going to get close to the end, and I want you to leave you with some things to think about. When you see something like this happen, like it happened with my brother, you ask yourself, why did this happen? You want to know why. And then you get an answer of nobody knows why. So I uh, felt the same way with my brother who passed at 37. I wanted to know why. I lost my best friend, honestly. And honestly, since then, I don't have any friends. I really don't. My brother-in-law is my only friend. And the way world, the world works, my brother-in-law's name is Marvin. His middle name is Dale. A very unusual name. That's my brother's name. So not only did I lose my brother, but I found a new one who had the same middle name as my brother. And he jokes with me, he says, I'm still working on that invention. I said, what is that? He says, it's the wheelbarrow casket, where there's a wheel in the front and two in the back. He says, because no one's coming to your funeral because you don't have any friends, Dwight. Because he said, you just, ever since you lost your brother, you don't want to have any friends. It's not going to be like this for me. And, and I understand that because I just, I'm, a, I'm an introvert and I did not understand what losing my brother meant to me internally. So I don't want you to live what I did which is to become an introvert and an and a antisocial person because that's not what Marcus would want for you either, okay? Um, so Marcus, uh, you know, was born out of families out of Nebraska in Independence, Kansas. Very, uh, out of, you know, his grandparents were Alma and Harry Pruitt. Uh, Alma and Harry had a great business in real estate and owning property. Harry Pruitt was one of the greatest Tuskegee Airmen in World War II. First time I met him, I was so proud. I said, hey, Harry, let's go fly. Because I, I had a pilot's license. I said, let's go fly. And it was funny. He, he basically said, no, nah, you can go with Garrett because <laughs> I'm not going on an airplane with you. I said, you're a Tuskegee Airman. You can trust me. He goes, that's why I'm going to stay on the ground. You go and fly with him. <laughs> um, his other grandparents, Lenny and Olga, came from Jamaica. That's why there's a flag there. And uh, they were just immigrants. They came here with a single suitcase. I don't have that type of courage. How many of us will pick up a suitcase today and fly to a country you never knew without a job and no one there? They came here and they said, we're going to build a life for our children. So Marcus was very close to his grandmother, um, so much so that when, he, uh, when she was getting close to her death in June, Marcus, I told him, I said, your grandmother is, 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 is getting old. She's getting sick. She's going to die, most likely. I said, I just wanted to let you know you don't need this shock. His answer was, where is she? I said, she's in intensive care in New York. Uh, he said, are you there? I said, no, I'm not. I said, I have a little problem. He goes, it's COVID. And the protocol is um, I have to have a test, and it has to be within three days. So I went to every test location I could in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where I was. And every time I took a test, they came back in four or five days, and I couldn't meet the criteria. So Mar Marcus said, I can get one. I got one. I'm going to go. I never asked him, and he went. So he went there, and as he landed there, they changed the protocol. And it wasn't that he had to have a three-day test. It was that they didn't want anybody up there because they had moved his mother from intensive care to normal care. So at the end of the day, he called me up. I said, he's sitting there in the lobby. He goes, they won't let me in, Dad. I made a couple quick calls. I didn't do much of anything. And next thing I know, he came back and said, they let me up. I said, how did that happen? He said, um, I don't know. He said, I think it's something you said. He, and I said, I, I, I didn't do much. I, so I just asked. He said, no, when he got up there, everybody said, who are you? Who are you? You know, they go, what do you mean, who am I? He says, I'm, this, I'm, the, grand, I'm the grandson of, of Mrs. Morgan. They go, no, no, no one has been up here in a year and a half. No one. You must be somebody. You must be like a rapper or somebody famous. And all he said was, is, I'm just his grandson. I'm just her grandson. Okay? So he got to see her, and he extended her life. I really do believe that. She perked up. She got home, which is what she wanted to do. She didn't want to die in the hospital, and she came home. And then Garrett came and made her food because we knew that we could extend her life. We couldn't fix her life at that time. So... Marcos was the only person allowed up there due to COVID protocols, and, um, you know, that's what happened. So I think right now we're all thinking that, you know what, none of us should even be here. 
right? None of us should be in this room together. We should be doing something else. Marcus should be doing something else. How did this happen? Why is he gone so soon? How did this happen to my brother now again to my son at such an early age? And many of you are saying, I heard some people talk yesterday, like, oh, I'm going to go to the doctor. Maybe it was health. I need to keep, I know I'm going to learn from Marcus. And, and, and at the end of the day, is he, is he really gone from us? So when I was uh, cleaning out my mother's home, she, uh, she was a nurse, but she was very much like Marcus. She was a self-taught, what I call a philosopher. The biggest problem with moving out of my mother's house for her is that she has over 2,000 books. And I can't make this up, 2,000 books. And there's some kids' books in there, you know, for her grandkids. But for the most part, it's 1,500 books that when I read them, I don't even understand them. They're very deep books. I'm a, I'm a cut and dried engineer kind of guy. She's a spiritual type of woman. She never lost her faith, but she honed her faith. When her son was taken from her, just like Marcus, I didn't know what it felt like. I knew what it felt like for my brother to be gone. And then when, it, when I ended up talking to my mother towards the end of her life, I said, Mom, I don't, what was it like to lose your son? At this time, Marcus was still alive. And she said, he wasn't my son. I said, oh, my God, Mom, what were you doing? What do you mean, was you not your son? She goes, it was God's son. I was on loan. He said, your brother was an angel on loan to us. And his job was done. And she said, because I couldn't understand my mom wasn't crying when my brother was dead. She said, I was entrusted to take care of him as his physical body, but he was never mine. He was of the spirit. She said, you will not, she told me, she says, you will never feel better about the loss of Marcus. You will only get used to the feeling of him being gone. Okay? You will only get used to that hollow, missing feeling, but you will never get over it. That's what she told me as a mother. So at the end of the day, I uh, started digging through my mother's 1,500 books, and I said, I, I don't even know how to do these things. There is, and I read through some of them, and I realized my mother kept everything she's ever done. But my mother was a, was a learner. She was a Reiki healer. Okay. I didn't believe in Reiki healing at all. I thought it was some kind of juju, voodoo nonsense. But I came home one day from college with an eye infection that no, one, no antibiotics could, could, ha could heal. And I laid in bed and cried for a week. And she sat, she sat there one day and said, I've had enough of this. And she said, move over. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she laid her hands on me, and my mother healed me. And I know it to be true. So my mother, so Marcus had a praying grandmother. And she prayed for him all the time. So she left behind a book here, it's, you know, a little 10 cent book. It's got 30 days in it, handwritten by her. She's got some of the most unbelievable hand penmanship. And I think it might help some of you today because it's helped, some of me. It's helped me. And I go through it, it's, a, it's something to read every day. And it's everything she's ever learned from 1,500 books in one little 30 day primer. And I will never you know, I never even knew this book existed until I started going through everything in my mother's property as we cleaned out her house. So on day four, I want to share something with you. On day four, it says, I know that I am a spiritual being, but I have put on a physical body so that I can adapt to the energy of the earth. However, as spirit, I am as God living forever. I was never born, and I will never die. I am with God. I am with the Spirit. I am energy. Forever, I will do so even after laying down my body at the end of my journey. So you don't have to be religious. You can choose to be, but you cannot choose to be spiritual. We are all spiritual. We are all an energy and a force. And Marcus is not gone. I can tell you that now. His job was over. 
The other thing I want to clear with you, because many of you asked me, like, how come we missed this? How come we didn't know about this? How did this happen and right under our noses and we didn't get caught? Well, I want to share with you one last thing, and then I'm going to wrap this up. And that is, I, uh, as I sit back in time, I learned a little bit about things to learn and to keep doing. Um, starting in January, Marcus made comments to some of, some, some of you that he said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to live real long. I don't know what it is. I just have a feeling I'm going to die real young. That's January. Okay? February, he said, if I don't get my blood pressure under control, I've got a feeling I'm going to have a heart attack. But he didn't. Okay? So Marcus was born on the 10th of uh, the month. We started to see what I call synchronicity. synchronicity. We started to see things that you have a choice to do what you want to do with these things. I'm not telling you to believe any of it or not. I can tell you one thing. My wife Kimberly has a gift, which I'm not sure it's a gift. It could be a curse. Okay? And that every time someone has passed in our family, and Kimberly has a huge family. There's 14 aunts and uncles, so there's th you know, hundreds of cousins. Unfortunately, the math is against you when you have that such a big a family in terms of having to go to funerals. And every time she would get dreams and she'd start feeling this heavy energy. And she'd say, it's close. I don't know who it is. She'd never know who it is. She'd never know. But she knew something was coming. And she knew that starting in January, she said, something is coming. And I don't know who it is. And we never thought of Marcus, because just like Marita said, not my Marcus, he's too strong. But the world around us and Marcus himself told us and sent us messages. Kimberly reached into her purse. How many of you today will reach into your purse or your pocket and pull out coins? If you pulled out nothing but 10 dimes, does that think that would be kind of odd? Would be odd to me that out of all the different currency, you get 10 dimes. Then you're walking down the street a day later and you step down to look and there's a dime in front of you, the number 10. And then as you're driving through a neighborhood you've never been in before, you look up and there's a sign and it's Market Street in Detroit. I've never been there in 35 years. So, so we videotaped it and said that to him and said, hey, Marcus, we found a street named after you. Okay? So at the end of the day, Marcus, uh, we, we got a lot of signs that we have to sometimes decide if we're going to let our intuition take it or not do it. There's many of you that went to school with Marcus probably remember the Pythagorean theorem from Egypt. Well, one of the things the Pythagoreans did was they also set forth numbers, not just engineering equations. And the numbers they set forth were numbers like 111, 222, 4, And the number 333 um, is the day of the arisen masters, Jesus himself, Moses, and Mary. We, uh, we have a orange juice container in our refrigerator. And you can see the photograph in Kim's phone. It has Marcus's birthday on it with an expiration date of 333. Okay? So, that's why today I don't sit here and cry with you because I know that my son was well taken care of by all of you. And I know that we started seeing the symbols of 10 and 22. His last phone call was at 10:22. We know that through checking his phone, and he never finished the call. So I want you to take advantage of these things. Look at the dimes in our fa in, in our pockets, food in the refrigerator. The ascended masters are near when the number 333 is there, and Marcus was called home. The answer is simple to all of you. Be mindful of patterns. Listen to your intuition. We were told of this through our intuition, and we missed it. And now it's easy for us to say that we justify it. Now, maybe you might think we're crazy, but I can tell you that after watching people pass throughout my life that I'm not crazy. Okay? So the last thing that Mark has taught me was the most important thing. I was blessed to have all of my kids as uh, the custodial parent for a short period of time. And I didn't realize how tough mothers had it to try to work and to do this. 
And I said, this is really killing me. This was tough. But what I learned during that time frame was I had to really, I was, I've always been academic. My parents always made me focus on school. They thought education is the best, is going to get you to do whatever you need to do in this world. That's what they believed, and that's how they raised me. So I did the same to my kids. So I put a lot of pressure on Marcus, and I realized he was very, very different. Garrett, Bianca, Savannah, they got, school was easy for them. Marcus, it wasn't. So I was going to school, we were getting them, you know, tutors and all this. And, I, and, I, and they even recommended they put him in special ed. Can you imagine how hurtful that would be to learn that your kid, and after all your other children are doing well, they want to put him in special ed? And I sat there, and I hurt, and it hurt, and it hurt. And at the end of the day, I asked Marcus, why can't you get it together, man? Why can't you get this together? You know what he said? He said, Dad, everybody learns differently. And I looked at him, I said, really? So I went to school for parents-teacher conferences, and the teacher told me all the problems that Marcus was having as a young kid in middle school. school. And you know what she said? You need to go do this, you need a tutor, he's got to learn disabilities and this and that. And I looked at her, I said, well, my son tells me he learns differently. I said, did you ever consider, Mrs. Teacher, that you're the problem? That the way you teach doesn't work for my son? And you know what? I thought I was going to get yelled at, told go, get off the table, next parent. She sat there and said, I thank you. I never thought of that. So what I learned from Marcus was there are book learners, there's visual learners, there's audio learners, there's people that learn by collaboration because you want to be around everybody and learn from each other. And my son self-taught himself everything that you now say that he's good at doing. He went to me one day about something in court legal documents. He asked me to help him on something. And he, he said, Dad, we're going to go do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And what he, he said, what do you think? I said, what do you mean we're going to do all this? He said, yeah, I'm going to change my name to capitalize, to lowercase, and all this, and all these things. I said, son, are you sure? I said, this doesn't make sense to me. He said, Dad, I'm telling you, this is going to work. He said, I've read it, I've studied it, and all that. I said, son, you are either the most brilliant legal mind or you were bat shit crazy okay <laughs> and I go either way I'm on T Marcus let's go do this and at the end of the day he prevailed so we know which one it was so at the end of the day um, expanded family is possible Marcus showed us the way I never believed that he taught me that he taught me that everybody learns differently he taught me that love is truly the answer and he also taught me something which I'm going to close with in that he said to me, when I wanted him to work with me, I started my own businesses, and I said, hey, Marcus, come work with me, you know? And uh, he, because I knew he was in, in between work, and he said to me, um, no thanks, Dad. I said, no thanks, I just gave you a job. You don't have a job, what are you talking about? He goes, no disrespect, but uh, your job sucks. <laughs> I said, I haven't even told you what a job is yet. How can it suck? He goes, uh, you work seven days a week. And he goes, I've watched you my whole life. And he said, Dad, I don't want to work. Okay, I don't want to live to work. I do not want to live to work. He says, Dad, you live to work. He says, I'm not being disrespectful. That's what you do. He says, I want to work so I can live. And he taught me that, and that is work doesn't always have to be the most important thing. So that's why Marcus traveled a lot. He wanted to find a job where he could control his own schedule, and I found that he was my teacher in the end. He taught me that everybody learns differently. Family is, in fact, truly always first. And my mother taught me to live in day one, live in the power of now. So in wrapping this up, everybody thinks they have more time. You don't. You don't, I don't. We don't have more time. So take this on and le as a lesson. Do things that you've been putting off. For these younger people in the audience that are into social media, uh, if you do pass before someone else, he said make, make these types of programs easier as well. Memorialize your social media. 
okay? So that you, those left behind can put together a, better, a, a story for you through your social media posts. I want to thank Bianca and Will for helping all the parents through this. And we couldn't have got to this day without you. I, I really was panicking with the flowers. I didn't think we were going to have enough. And now, I mean, look, look, at, look at the abundance. And I learned about people that sent flowers I never thought would even, I mean, there's people that I work with that I met three times in my life. And they're in California, and they send this beautiful flower arrangements for me. And I never knew that I touched them somehow. Thanks to Kimberly and to Marita for sharing yourselves together with Marcus and not having any concern about how each other felt and, and realizing that you both had each other's back to help Marcus go get through this. William, thank you for coming in and supporting Marita and supporting the family. I know it's not easy when you're maybe one of the, the few people that you know here. Right? It's a tough, a tough job to do. And thanks, Kimberly, for supporting me and Marcus and all my kids. So that's all I have to say. Um, Remember this, you can choose to be religious, but you cannot choose to be spiritual. As my mother said on day four of her findings of her entire life of 90 years old and reading 1,500 books, we are all spiritual beings that have taken on a physical form to survive on earth. Our goal here is to learn and be better so that when our, we put our body down and that spirit moves on the next time around, it's wiser and smarter to do it again. Thank you for all, especially those standing up. We love you, and thank you. As we all stand, as we all stand, If okay. the repass will be at 2000 Brooklyn Street, Detroit, Michigan. That sounds like a New York address. It is. Okay. That's where I was born. <laughs> okay, it ain't your fault. <laughs> But I pray that we leave here with joy, happiness, and a spirit of uh, burst in love. Uh, Garrett and the rest of the siblings, man, y'all have, it, 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 your parents got to be proud of you. You know, even with your silliness and telling on yourself and, you know, now they can get you late. In a couple of weeks, you'll be in trouble all over again. And it'll be, you know, uh, you, you can't even blame Marcus, but you will. Uh, but, you know, somewhere along the line, your daddy might slap you up inside the head for what you said that you didn't, you said under, you know, a different pretense. But I want everybody, if you could be kind enough, if you could be kind enough, look somebody straight in the eye. They didn't look that bad, did they? Now look somebody else in straight in the eye and tell them you're a wonderful soul. Now treat it like that. And look at somebody behind you. Say, you're just the beginning of your life. Don't mess it up. Each day is another day of a beginning. Take each day to treasure. You're not given the promise of a tomorrow. You're given a promise of right now. Give your love, your spirit, your kindness. Our world is appearing to be crazy. It appears. But to be true, it is just the world. And nothing is promised to be right, wrong, or indifferent. It's just the world. Just know that the God inside of you has value. And share it with somebody. Go home and hug a son, hug a daughter. Don't hug a dog. <laughs> Don't squeeze the cat. Look for your husband. Look for your boyfriend. Well, you shouldn't have a boyfriend. You should have a fiance. Somebody help me. I'm old-fashioned. I'm sorry. I'm so proud of this family and the love that y'all have displayed, the peace that you've shown, the strength that you have shown. 
Uh, and when I say to uh, Mr. Morgan, man, I'm so proud of you, man. You, you, you found, I know Kim has been my friend a long time, you found a friend. And when you can get somebody to come in the kitchen with you on the eve of, you know, doing the eulogy, uh, and I think he was just really, to be Kim, honest with you, Kim, I think he was in there just trying to figure out how I cook so he can do something for you special. So when you, when you, when you get dinner in a couple of weeks, you, you know where he got it from. All right. You can pay me later. Uh, I, I wish y'all learned how to laugh. I always tell people when I'm taking pictures, smile, but don't pass gas. Y'all will catch that on the way to the parking lot. So look at your neighbor and say, smile. Please don't do that. Lord God, we thank you for this power of love, the spirit, the peace, the harmony of our hearts. Bind us in our mindset that we cannot ignore your love, your grace, your angels descending. That you would give a cosmic effect. Dispatch angels all around our lives and touch us, hold us in the spirit of your love. Touch these mothers, touch these father images, touch the brother, touch the sister, in every extended individual. We praise you and thank you. Keep us safe in this journey. Allow the peace of your love to give us understanding. It is in Jesus' name we thank you for your good and perfect gift. And all the people said, now I believe the undertakers are coming to give instructions. Yeah. And just so everybody knows, uh, we're going to go to the repast. Marcus will be cremated and his ashes will be distributed amongst the family, but also taken to rest where he wanted, which was the, in the Caribbean Sea next to his grandmother and grandfather. As such, these flowers will not end up at a uh, gravesite. So we are going to ask all of those who would like to take something, not to take the whole thing. After Marita and Kimberly take what they want, we are going to take the red roses to the uh, uh, repast. But we, after Marita and Kimberly take what they would like, then feel free to take a, a stem or two uh, with you as you desire. Okay? Thank you. As it pleases the Almighty God, the born of a woman. Please remain where you are. The Shh. As it pleases the Almighty God, born of a woman only of a few days, and each one of those days are full of trouble. We now commit your body, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. May God give peace in your rest. Thank you, Lord God, for receiving his soul, his spirit. Father, we thank you right now for this opportunity to say thank you. For your wide open arms to receive him, for your heart to have already gathered him. Give peace, joy, and happiness to his soul, to his wonderful spirit. Send smiles from heaven and joy in the midst of the air. It is in Jesus' name we thank you for every good and perfect gift. Bless this soul. Amen.